Chapter 2 The Grand Fleet in War and Peace On the 1st of May 1918, aged 16 years and 4 months, midshipman T.K.W. Atkinson joined HMS Warspite at Rosyth, at that time a major naval base upstream from Edinburgh on the north shore of the 4th Estuary. He started his diary fairly soon after but the first few pages have been damaged by water and cannot be read. Perhaps, nearly a century later, there are two things that may need explaining. What is a midshipman, and what sort of ship was the war spite? Midshipmen were a kind of apprentice naval officer. They were still under training before becoming commissioned officers, but they also had defined responsibilities aboard a ship. In the 18th and 19th centuries, midshipmen were very much a product of the rigid class system in British society. The officers were mostly gentlemen, and the seamen and petty officers were definitely not. They were lower deck, and did not mix with officers. Indeed, one of the functions of the Royal Marines was to protect the officers from the crew, and a marine sentry would be posted outside the captain's cabin of a large ship though latterly his function was primarily to guard the keyboard. By 1918, as we have seen, it was possible for people to become officers who were not from the established elite private education system, the public schools, in Britain. But if Ken's term at Osborne was representative, it was still only a minority who came from the grammar schools, which were in theory open to all on merit. Mr. Midshipman Easy, by Captain Marriott, is superficially a boy's jolly adventure story, but to the modern reader a rather acid social commentary on the evils of patronage and favouritism in the early 19th century Royal Navy. It was written in 1836, and much had changed by 1915 largely as a result of changes in officer training brought in by Admiral Jackie Fisher some ten years earlier. But the social division continued. His Majesty's ship Warspite was a battleship, the successor of the Nelson's Line of the Battleship, a strong, heavily armed ship, capable of taking its place in the line of battle and exchanging broadsides of of cannon fire with similar enemy ships in a parallel line as near as either side dared or could manage to get, until enough ships had been disabled, blown up, or surrendered to make it obvious who had won. In theory, the genius of Horatio Nelson had changed all that by his tactics at the Battle of Trafalgar but in World War I battleships were still being built to slug it out in a line of battle, as at the Battle of Jutland, even if it rarely worked out like that. The war spite was launched in November 1913 and did take part in the Battle of Jutland, where it was one of the most modern among the 27 British battleships present in that famously inconclusive but ultimately decisive action. Warspite's steering gear jammed during the battle, and the ship came under a heavy concentration of enemy fire and was badly damaged. However, it was able to carry out temporary repairs and was ordered to return to Rosyth. The legible part of Ken's diary starts in mid-June, and the first few days are fairly typical of the life of a midshipman. A mixture of schoolwork, housekeeping, sport and practical command of one of the ship's boats. The latter was to give the midshipman a taste of leadership, although, no doubt, much advice would be given tactfully by the coxswain of the boat, an experienced seaman. Wednesday, June 19th, 1918 I am very glad I never went to the Malaya's show last night, although I believe it was very good because they didn't get back till after 1am. There was no physics this morning, and owing to us being on two hours' notice, the picket boat did not go out, so I didn't have much to do. We did a little instruction during the morning, but stopped at 11am. At 11.10am, a signal came through. Have steam for 20 knots at half hour's notice, 
and later raise steam for slow speed with the utmost dispatch and prepare to unmoor immediately. Of course we are all certain that there was something on. All boats were hoisted in and one anchor weighed, but so far, up until 9.15pm, nothing else has happened. But we were still on half hour's notice, and so the PB, picket boat, has not gone out at all, and we did no instruction. This evening I got my washing from home, together with this notebook, fountain pen, my wrist watch and some eggs, which was very nice. I'm going to turn in now. The new cook we have got for the gunroom mess is a marvel. We really get some good food now. It is a great treat. I put four pounds in the post office today. Thursday, June 20th. During the night we were put back to two hours notice and this morning we reverted to our usual four hour notice. That was at 7.25 a.m. I took the early postman's trip, but it is Pugsley's day on, so I had nothing else to do all day. During the morning instruction we rigged shears on the forecastle with Mr Mahoney. Just before we went out in the gig at 11.30, I was informed that I had to play cricket against HMS Courageous, but as I am not much good I got them to change me and got off. So I had nothing to do during the afternoon as it was a make and mend and I wrote to mother and sent my washing off. For lunch today I had an omelette made out of some of the eggs mother sent me yesterday. It was most delicious. I got a PC from mother this morning. The weather is certainly improving but this evening it rained and the wind was rather strong. Friday, June 21st. I didn't have a trip at all this morning, and I went to physics. During instruction, we were, as usual, taken round by the boatswain, and this morning we were shown the cat and nine tails, which isn't nearly as such a fearsome instrument as I had imagined. During the afternoon, I was running the picket boat from 1pm to 9pm, with only a few small intervals, during one of which I had some tea. Anyhow, I missed instruction and quarters, which is something, and I eased my headache, which has come on today. I think it will have gone by tomorrow morning. I got letters from Mother and Violet today. They do write a lot. It is ripping of them. The weather today is pretty averagely beastly, though I believe it is Midsummer's Day. Edwards and Stone left today, and so now there are only two watchkeepers, Hunter and Robertson, term mates of Ken's from Dartmouth. Saturday, June 22nd. Today the wind has got very strong, and it is quite choppy even in here. Only the picket boats are allowed out, and all the crew have to wear life belts, like they do up at Scalper. Thank goodness! It isn't my day for the PB today. Hunter is leaving us now for the old superb, so there is only Robertson left for a watchkeeper. Consequently, it has been arranged that there shall be no midshipman of the watch, and Robertson is coming with me in the PB. At that time, Warspite was powered by coal-fired boilers driving steam turbines and the constantly changing orders for steam were necessitated by the time taken to raise steam manually through stokers shoveling tons of coal into the stoke holes of the boilers. Intelligence was very unreliable, and although the major units of the German fleet had been cooped up in harbour for many months, the British had to be on the alert for them putting to sea in order to raid the coast of England, as they had done earlier in the war, notably shelling Scarborough and Hartlepool. Through the rest of June, Ken's diary continued in much the same way. Running the picket boat, swapping watches, instruction, food parcels and washing from home, and regular letters and washing to mother. He went to communion, though the service doesn't seem to have been well attended. Church parade was also regular, but almost certainly compulsory. Boat duty had priority and frequently interrupted other activities, as it had in his extract from Sunday, 23rd of June. During the morning the weather was very nice, and I had a good many trips in the picket boat, 
But towards the end of the forenoon, the wind got up and it got quite rough. During one of the trips, when we had arrived back at the ship, Robertson, who now comes with me in the boat, fell into the ditch between the boat and the ship and got thoroughly drenched. He went right under, and I thought he would be squashed between the side of the ship and the boat, which was jumping about somewhat. Anyhow, it was quite all right. There was a cinema during the evening. It started about 8.45. I was called away in the middle to fetch the captain from HMS Australia. I got turned in at about 11pm. I nearly finished the elusive Pimpernel today. I went to morning service, but was called away in the middle to run the PB. The accident to Robertson was passed off with curious aplomb. It was wartime and trivial, and with no serious consequences. At the end of the next week, Ken had his first trip to sea. They went out at 7.30pm on Friday night, 28th of June, with the whole of the Grand Fleet in support, and HMS Furious ahead. At that time, Furious, originally designed as a light battle cruiser, had been converted into carrying aircraft, and the plan was for its aeroplanes to bomb Kiel or some such place, Ken surmised. Ken kept the middle watch, midnight until 4am, on the forebridge, though, curiously, on immediate action being sounded at 2am, they went to their action stations and settled down for a sleep. At about 4am, they were told that operations were suspended owing to the weather. The wind had got up and the clouds were very low, and they were to return to base. So we haven't had our action after all, but we may get it in a few days' time. They were let out of action stations on Saturday morning at about 9.30am, having had seven hours in the cramped gunnery control tower. They seem not to have got back to base until early on the Sunday morning, but Ken must have been fairly exhausted as the dates and times in his diary don't make complete sense. However, Ken went to church and reported that a Marine Corporal got had up for writing a letter to Titbits and putting it in one of those private envelopes. During the afternoon he did the quarterly tobacco bills and got jolly sick of them. This was possibly the nearest Ken got to action as July continued in a similar way, with physics, seamanship and navigation the main subjects of instruction, frequently liable to cancellation as on the 1st of July when physics was cancelled because Warspite was coaling ship, though Ken had no part in that operation. During that week Warspite unmoored and anchored off Burnt Island, further out in the Firth. Ken had three busy days, which illustrate the chaotic life the midshipmen were leading, including thinking he had nine hours sleep when the times given indicate it was only six, but still much longer than on some occasions. Burnt Island was a better location for gunnery practice, and there was also a regatta among the ship's boats, with Ken towing racing boats up the course. A night firing exercise with the six-inch guns firing star shells saw Ken manning a searchlight for two hours until 2.30 in the morning and wondering that he hadn't got shell shock. Another day of towing regatta boats followed until the weather became too rough and all the small boats were hoisted in. This didn't prevent Ken's picket boat towing Liberty men, sailors given day leave, ashore and bringing them back when he describes rolling right under, with his legs under water nearly all the time, except when going against the wind when his upper half got soaked. Later he received his washing and paid his servant ten shillings, fifty pence in today's money, which seemed to him a great waste of money, especially in wartime. Indeed, it does seem a lot, considering that a midshipman's pay was probably only a few pounds a month, while the sailors were only getting 19 pence a day, old pence equivalent to about 4 pence now. This rate had apparently not changed since the mid-19th century and led to various underreported mutinies in the Royal Navy after the war in 1919. On Saturday, 6th of July, 
Ken hoped to go ashore himself after a short signal exercise and a trip out in the gig. He had hoped to meet his friend Hughes Hallett at Hall's Pier, to which he had been looking forward all week. As he was on his way up to the Liberty boat, he was told that they had been put on one and a half hours' notice to put to sea. His comment in his diary was, I don't think I have ever been in such a temper in all my life. After I had cooled down a little, it is rotten we are always at sea on a Saturday. We played bridge and I lost six pence, which grieves me sorely. During the afternoon we got orders to prepare to unmoor at 7.30, so I should get the middle watch as usual, and we will go to sea then, just my luck. So they did go to sea at 7.30 on Saturday evening, and Ken did get the middle watch, turning out at 11.30pm and spending the watch making cups and cups of cocoa. A glorious middle watch, he comments with some irony. A large part of the fleet was at sea for the exercise on Sunday, which comprised two battles, with a change of teams after a two and a half hour break for lunch. The 5th Battle Squadron, comprising United States battleships, together with Furious and her sister ships Courageous and Glorious, numerous light cruisers and other units of the Grand Fleet took part. Three hours sleep for Ken was followed by another middle watch, another glorious middle. Oh, how I enjoy turning out at midnight. The Furious, Courageous and Glorious were strange ships, originally designed as light battle cruisers of about 20,000 tonnes, fast and lightly armoured, but with the heavy guns of a battleship. Four 15-inch cannons in Courageous and Glorious, and two 18-inch guns in Furious. The latter ship was never successful and was converted into an aircraft carrier, in which role it served in World War II as indeed did the other two. At the time of this diary, the 18-inch guns had been removed from Furious, and part flight decks added fore and aft. The other two ships also lost their heavy guns, and were converted into aircraft carriers between the wars, but in 1918 were still in their original form. The rest of July seems to have been a relatively quiet period. The midshipmen were ordered by the captain to write essays on what had happened in the battles, and were told not to let it interfere with their ordinary work. This seems to have promoted a certain rebelliousness, as Ken wrote his account and a letter to his mother during navigation instruction. Later, he sent his washing home and developed a roll of film which didn't come out. These were the days when photography was in its infancy, and people developed their own films. A little later, his was slightly more successful, though the results were rotten. He complained the price of printing paper was one pence per sheet. Quarter plate, 8.3 by 10.8 centimetres, and was astounded that the price of hypo, sodium thiosulfate, used to fix photographic images, had gone up from two pence to one shilling per pound. Less domestic matters included taking the picket boat to bring off a steward from House Pier when the captain of HMS Birmingham commandeered the passage so they had to take him to his beastly ship, which was going to sea. On the 9th of July, the King and Queen of Belgium came on board, had tea and took dozens of photographs. Allard and Ken were supposed to be down at the gangway to help them on board. But, strange to say, they both went ashore, and Anson and Ryan had to take their places. Poor king and queen, Ken commented. Mr Simmons asked the midshipmen if that was the best that they could produce. That afternoon a terrific thunderstorm arrived and three observation balloons were struck by lightning and came down in flames. There was no record in Ken's diary of casualties. There is a rather peevish, sarcastic tone to some of these entries, understandable in view of the frequent changes of plan. It's not clear whether the failure to greet the Belgian royals was frustration or deliberate evasion. Ken must have been very tired, and further attempts to meet John Hughes Hallett and other friends failed. On the 20th of July, he unfortunately missed his early trip in the picket boat, 
which led to him being given forty-eight hours watch and watch, which finished on the twenty-third, when he had kept forenoon, first dog, and first watches until ten p.m. That is to say, o eight hundred to twelve hundred, sixteen hundred to eighteen hundred, and twenty hundred to twenty-two hundred. Only an eight-hour day, as he was let off the second half of the first watch, but coming after presumably alternate watches in the previous twenty-four hours. What a strange life it was for a sixteen-year-old! Mock battles in the North Sea during the night, navigation instruction, picket boat duty, watch-keeping, and letter-writing during the days. Perhaps someone realised that they were getting overtired as Ken and Pugsley were relieved of picket boat duties from then on. In these months, there is very little mention of the war, and life seems to have been fairly relaxed when at anchor. Although the time taken to raise steam for sea and the potential vulnerability of Ross Sythe to submarine attack probably explain the constant changes of plan. However. Ken seems to have managed to get ashore frequently, twice at least to play golf. Shipboard entertainment included shows and in the cinema, still silent in 1918, on other ships. An entry for Saturday, 27th of July, reads: Went to the Texas show at 8:15 and stayed there until around 1 a.m. It was a very good show. The scenery was simply glorious. It was a skit of Chu Chin Chow. Only I was very sleepy, and my stern got confoundedly sore on the hard bench. The USS Texas was part of the U.S. Battle Squadron and had joined the Grand Fleet by 1918. Ken took some photos of the U.S. ships, which were some of the very few successful ones to survive. The following morning, Sunday, he went to communion on board, and thought he was going to be the only one there, but more turned up later. Communion, early service, was voluntary, whereas church parade was compulsory. Deck hockey and bridge were other shipboard activities, and hockey resulting in stiff ankles and legs, and the loss of Atkinson's stick over the side. Ken records doing field exercises one morning, and he tried to get ashore for golf during a make and mend, but was frustrated, perhaps because they were ammunitioning ship, with the new shell-like shells which are supposed to pierce anything. So he did the month's tobacco bills instead. The reference to new shells is interesting. At the Battle of Jutland, the British shells were incapable of piercing the German ship's armor plate. Effective armor-piercing ordnance was only developed by the Royal Ordnance Department later in 1917, and this was presumably its first deployment with the fleet. On the 8th of August, the ship was sent to sea again, with the Sixth Battle Squadron, the Yanks, supporting a mine-laying operation. But returning to harbour some 48 hours later, Ken, having stood his usual most delightful middle watch. With an electric kettle and water, but no cocoa, so he drank hot water. Though Mr. Adams, on watch with him, had soup in a thermos. This doesn't seem to have caused resentment. The mine layers laid quite a lot of eggs, and Ken was delighted that they were going back to Rothsyth and not Scarpa. He also mentions that the Yanks had sighted a German submarine and had opened fire on it, and one of the destroyers had dropped a depth charge. The next day, he was called by Pugsley at eight forty-five a.m. to take the morning watch. Pugsley, for once, having had the pleasure of the middle. As he was going up to the bridge, Pugsley told him that a zeppelin had just passed over our stern and had not given the recognition signals. When I got up onto the bridge, the zeppelin was still in sight, only steering on a parallel course. All the six-inch and high-angle guns were loaded with shrapnel and ready to fire, but the zeppelin kept out of range, and after about half an hour, she gave the recognition signals. So after all the excitement, she was only a British one. They were back in harbour at six fifty a.m. The only incident being that the port paravane Derrick carried away as they were getting the paravanes in. 
These were streamed as a precaution against mines. Ken then went ashore with Anson to the cinema in Danfermline and had an excellent time. The film was one of the best he had ever seen, but he doesn't say what it was. He also did some shopping. The Angora, one of the mine layers, was a British India steam navigation company passenger cargo ship taken over by the Navy as an auxiliary mine layer between 1915 and 1919, laying over 14,000 mines during that period. The Amphitrite, another ship on the same exercise, was a converted armoured cruiser with four funnels, launched in 1898 and laid up in reserve in 1915 until its conversion as a mine layer. There was a sense during August that the war was drifting to a close. There was an alert on the 14th when the ship was on one hour's notice for 18 knots and an exercise on the 15th with gunnery practice, action stations and the Admiral's inspection on the 16th. Ken had to go and attend on the Admiral, who went all round the ship, E.T. asking questions the whole time. There was also more leisure time, Ken going ashore with Anson twice in that week to Dunfermline, where they don't seem to have done much except have tea and spend money. Presumably they couldn't stray too far from the ship in case there was a call to put to sea, though the time needed to raise steam meant that the ships couldn't move in a hurry. However, the next day, Saturday the 17th of August, Ken and Allard went to Edinburgh in the afternoon travelling in the guards' van with about a hundred others. There they met Usher and went to play tennis at his house, followed by a very good tea. The Admiral came on board again for divisions and church on Sunday. Ken remarked that he looked very bored, and so was Ken. The afternoon was a little more exciting. Ken went out in the whaler with Corlett and Gillett. They suffered a number of misfortunes, including ramming the stern of a drifter coming alongside the ship, running full speed into the boom defence, and finally having to be rescued from a leaking boat by a launch, which, in towing them away, ran them full speed into one of the piles, so smashing their bows in. They got back just in time for tea, and didn't drown or even sink the boat. Towards the end of August, life seems to have been much more active, anchoring at Burnt Island between gunnery exercises. On Tuesday the 20th of August, the Admiral came round again, and most of the midshipmen had to train guns crews, sailboats, or something more or less terrifying. Terrifying may be, but sailing was one of the things that Ken really enjoyed. On Thursday, the 22nd of August, the whole Grand Fleet went to sea for exercises. The weather was nasty, and Ken was woken at 3.10am on the Friday morning by the gunroom crockery, rolling about and breaking up in a most disturbing way. At 6am the ship was rolling 12 degrees each side, and this continued until early afternoon when it gradually decreased. Not surprisingly, Ken began to feel somewhat ill, which he seems to have connected with having eggs for breakfast for the first time for months. His afternoon was spent corking decks in sunshine and eating numerous apples while nearly rolling off every time the ship rolled. After keeping the first watch, 8pm to midnight, Ken and Tremaine raided the pantry for cocoa and sandwiches before turning in. The following Wednesday, the 28th of August, Ken was woken at 3.30am by Pugsley's hammock stretcher falling on the deck. He then found that the hands were being turned out at 4am and the ship was preparing for sea at 4.30am. Despite this, he managed to get another hour of sleep, turning out at about 6.50am to find that the ship was doing 20 knots and the whole Grand Fleet was out after five German battlecruisers who were said to be at sea. After about three hours, the ship returned to harbour, the Germans evidently having fled, or perhaps they had never been out. 
Twenty knots was a good speed for the fleet. Warspite's design speed was twenty-four knots, and her class were the fastest of the battleships. The rest, including the Iron Duke, were designed for a maximum speed of about twenty-one knots. The battle cruisers, BCs, were considerably faster, around thirty knots. In fact, the German Western Front in France and Flanders had begun to collapse during August. The reducing menace from the German submarines in the Atlantic was allowing U.S. troops to arrive in France in greater numbers. The German high seas fleet was preparing to leave the Flanders coast, which indicates that further offensive action was not in the minds of the high command. The German fleet had made no move since April, and signs were not wanting that its fighting spirit had departed. As early as May 1917, there had been unrest and outbreaks of mutiny in some of the larger ships. On Sunday, the 1st of September, Ken recorded a rumour that von Hipper had sworn to sink the British Navy or die, and that the fleet was going on notice every night and were not going to scarper. The rumour was substantially correct. Von Scheer, by then German Chief of Naval Staff, had planned a last raid into the Channel by the whole of the High Seas Fleet, whilst a concentration of submarines in the North Sea attacked the fleet on its way south. The recall of submarines from their war on commerce explains the reducing menace to shipping, which allowed the flow of American troops to France. Meanwhile, back in war spite, Ken was making only brief entries in his diary. On the 14th, they had a gunnery exam, in which he came fourth with 70%, despite purporting to have had no warning of the exam. I knew nothing about it and couldn't do anything. A new class of midshipmen had arrived on board, and Ken made instant judgments on them, which were mostly quickly revised from simply foul to quite decent. One must assume that his judgment of people matured equally quickly. He even went ashore with one of them on one of his very frequent trips ashore, usually with H&H, &H, but with others too, Anson, Davies, who was a very nice fellow, often to Dunfermline, once to Crammond Bridge. The squadron regatta took place over several days in this period. An accident is recorded in the middle of the month. A torpedo struck them from a destroyer, and the ship was vibrating like anything, so they anchored at Burnt Island and had divers down. If there is anything wrong, we may have to go into dock and get some leave. Cheers! Happily, or sadly, the divers found nothing wrong. Watchkeeping and instruction, navigation and rifle drill continued as usual, with shore leave and sailing for variety. Ken records sailing the gig to Barnum on the 20th of September. It was very windy, and they had to let fly the sheet several times. Von Hipper's rumoured threats had not come to pass, and evidently the Admiralty didn't know what was planned, because towards the end of September, war spite, probably with the whole 5th Battle Squadron, if not the fleet, set off for Scarpa Flow. The passage took some fifty hours, rather longer than Ken expected, perhaps because of the weather. Divisions were held on the first morning at sea, although the ship was rolling quite a lot. Ken was intermittently on watch, keeping successively the first watch, sleeping, smoking, drinking cocoa, and eating chocolates in the night shelter, but also standing by a three-inch high angle gun and then the afternoon watch seems to have been spent reading in the night shelter. On the third day, Ken had the middle watch, when it was blowing so hard that one could barely stand up, so the high-angle gun was not manned. Waking on the fourth day, Thursday the 26th of September, the ship was still in Pentland Firth, and rolling terribly in those notorious waters. The seas were going right up over the forebridge, and at one time over the valiant spotting top. 
The rest of the month it was back to instruction with Schooley and the other harbour routines of running the ship's boats and, once, going out with the gig. A trip which was a little fraught as the wind got up and Ken reports the gig as doing about ten knots with the gunwale under and the crew of four, Privet, Tremaine and Broderick, with Ken soaked and frozen. Because the ship was under notice to raise steam for sea, much of the time shore leave was restricted to flotter. October opened with the ship going back to Rosyth and the return taking only about 24 hours and no talk of exercises on the way. The change of plan meant that the rifle drill and a regatta had to be cancelled and also a visit from the Borodino, which Ken reckoned would have been a waste of money. There was also a press message about Bulgaria, which cheered Ken up a great deal. The Bulgarian front gave way during September, which is presumably the purport of the Bulgarian press message. Or, in the words of Frompkin, suddenly and unexpectedly an Allied breakthrough came in Bulgaria. That country had been an ally of the German-Austrian forces, but succumbed to a lightning attack from the French led Allied forces fighting the Ottoman Empire in Greece. This attack was followed up by a devastating offensive on the Danube, which undermined the German Western Front. The Borodino was a Russian battlecruiser, presumably like the US squadron, operating with the Grand Fleet, though where her loyalty lay a year after Lenin had seized power in Petersburg and Russia had dropped out of the war is not clear. The morning of Sunday the 6th of October was very stormy with a great wind. After church, Warspite raised steam for slow speed to ensure safety. About tea time they went out to Burnt Island but dragged an anchor and came back. One light cruiser parted her cable and all the destroyers returned to base. The storm must have been fierce as sea watch keepers were keeping watch on the bridge all night and through the next day. Steam was kept for slow speed to ensure safety and once or twice they unmoored and altered their billet as they were dragging. A signal came from Monday forenoon to have steam for unmooring by 11.15am but at that time it was too rough and sailing was postponed but steam for 18 knots at two and a half hours notice was kept. At 1200 hours they went to sea again and proceeded straight up to Scarpa. It wasn't as rough as Ken thought after the storm. He kept the last dog watch, 6 to 8 p.m., and then had a very welcome night in. Ken was to have had a forenoon watch, but they arrived at Scarpa before then. So this time the passage had taken less than eight hours, suggesting that the ship was going somewhere near full speed. After some very noisy gunnery practice, Ken had a walk in foul weather on Flotter, followed by a simply gorgeous tea at a farm, and the ship returned to Rosyth during Friday night. On the 15th of October they were at sea again, and Ken stood the remains of the afternoon watch until 4pm, and then the middle watch 8pm until midnight. Next day was entirely at sea and very foggy. Ken had to go right up onto the foxhole and couldn't see the next ship ahead, the Valiant. He describes being in an awful funk, standing right up in the bows and not being able to see anything with the ship going about 17 knots and him getting drenched and frozen. About 20 minutes later, he was joined by a petty officer and an able seaman, and a megaphone, and also the ship reduced speed to 9 knots, and it was much more pleasant. After about two hours, the fog cleared away and he packed up, spending the other two hours in the night shelter on the forecastle. All day they had been going up and down the scene of the Battle of Jutland, waiting for the weather to clear so that the Furious could let off her planes. All they sighted in that time were about ten mines and a possible enemy destroyer. They fired at some of the mines with Lewis guns for exercise, but hit none. The next day Ken kept the morning watch, 
but at 4am it was very dark and spray was coming over the foxhole, so after making cocoa for Privet, he slept very peacefully in the night shelter. This activity on the part of the fleet continued a week later when war spite was at sea again. Perhaps the Admiralty had become aware of the imminence of von Hipper's threat. They clearly believed that some German units were at sea as, on the 24th of October, the British battlecruisers thought they were chasing the German first scouting group. But at about 3pm it seemed that the Germans had not come out, so the fleet proceeded to carry out mine laying off Norway. The next day it was very rough again, and the ship was being thrown about like a cork. They were shipping it practically green on the forecastle, and Ken had to keep right up in the corner of the night shelter to keep it all dry. One wonders what the point was of sitting in the night shelter for hours, ostensibly on watch. At least Ken was not feeling seasick. He thought he must have got over it. Others were not so fortunate. The first person to use the bucket on the forebridge was Sub-Lieutenant Corlett, and the second, Mr. Cooper. Lots of the midshipmen were very ill, especially Davies, who remained in one place the whole time except when on watch. It was too rough to mine lay, so they went round and round off the coast of Norway all day. Two more days at sea, with occasional action stations, but no sign of the enemy, effectively ended the war for the fleet, and Ken's diary entries are very brief from the end of October. On the 29th of October, while Ken had reverted to rugby and hockey, Von Hipper had given the signal for his capital ships to prepare for sea and open mutiny had broken out in the German fleet. The German crews refused to sail. Two days later, Ken reported that Austria and Turkey, Germany's allies, appeared to have chucked up the sponge altogether and a damned good job too. On the 4th of November, he noted that Austria had certainly declared peace, though there was still time for accidents in the fleet. At 6am on the 5th of November, Warspite's second picket boat raised steam with utmost dispatch. It seemed that during the night there had been a storm, and that the Campania had broken her moorings and drifted onto the Royal Oak. The latter wasn't damaged but the Campania was badly damaged and sank later in the day, all hands having been taken off before, presumably with the assistance of Warspite's picket boat. The Campania had been an ocean liner, built in 1892, and converted as an experimental seaplane tender and aircraft carrier. She trained with the Grand Fleet, but was frequently modified and doesn't seem to have seen any active service. She missed Jutland, and did indeed sink in the Firth of Forth on the 5th of November 1918. On the 6th of November, Ken got a letter from his sister Violet, who was at home, her college having had to close owing to flu, no doubt a reference to the notorious flu epidemic of that year. On the 10th of November, Ken had an inoculation against flu. Instruction continued, though on November the 7th, Ken had to attend commanders and captains defaulters because of a boy, and so got off most of the day's instruction. I presume that the midshipmen acted as divisional officers to the ship's boy seamen, or maybe attended defaulter parades as prisoner's friend. The same day, there were great rumours of peace, but not true. By the 8th of November, news of the revolution in Germany had got through to war spite, and the rumours of peace were on the point of becoming true, though instruction continued and also sport. A raging storm on the 10th of November prevented Ken's visit from Hooper. The entry in Ken's diary for Armistice Day shows how remote life in the Grand Fleet was at this period of the war from the horrors of the land war whether Flanders or Gallipoli or Mesopotamia. Monday, November the 11th. Got off physics owing to the inoculation. 
About 9.30, we intercepted a wireless message saying that the armistice with Germany had been signed, and later it was confirmed. The hands got an extra tot of rum and all got to make an end. Had a fine evening ragging all night and quite a good display of fireworks and music from all ships. So ended for Ken the Great War, as it was known, until a longer and more destructive one followed only 21 years later. For the Royal Navy, it wasn't the end. It was only an armistice, a hold fire, a suspension of hostilities. The German Navy was in revolution, but it was still potentially a powerful fighting force, frustrated and not defeated, and remaining virtually intact. It seems that there had been much discussion among the Allies, Britain, France and the United States, as to whether the disarmed fleet should be interned by the Allies or allowed to go to a neutral port under Allied supervision. The impracticality of the latter and the reluctance of neutral countries to accept the fleet resulted eventually in the decision to intern the fleet at Scarpa Flow and arrangements being left to Admiral Beatty. Time was short. The terms of the armistice agreement dictated that the fleet should be surrendered by the 18th of November, one week after the signing of the armistice. The German crews were in open revolt, and the ships were effectively controlled by revolutionary committees, who refused to obey or respect their officers. In some of the smaller ships, the crews remained loyal, reflecting the more intimate and better relations in such situations. The same was true of the Royal Navy Mutiny in Invergordon in 1930. The German submarine fleet was subject to different arrangements and had drawn off the best seamen from the high seas fleet. Beatty's reaction was to demand the presence of a German flag officer, an admiral, to come to the fourth in a disarmed light cruiser to make the arrangements. Ken's diary for that time is very perfunctory. The 4th was blanketed in fog for much of the week following the 11th of November, a Monday. Warspite was to go out on exercise on Tuesday and then again on Wednesday, but the exercises were all cancelled. Physics and navigation instruction continued, and the ship's show was held. On Saturday, the 16th of November, Ken invited Hughes Hallett over to the show, but owing to the fog, no boats could come from any ship except Valiant and Texas. Whatever Beatty's plans, they seem to have had very little salience in the lives of midshipmen, being referred to obliquely in Ken's entry for the day before the High Seas Fleet was due to be surrendered. The German light cruiser, Konigsberg, had arrived at Rosyth on Friday evening, the 15th of November. Ken reports its departure on Sunday, but also that the officers who went ashore in the afternoon were left on the beach all night owing to the fog. After church, Ken went ashore and met H.H., Hooper and Magne. They had quite a good time. The next day there was instruction as usual and rumours, great buzzes, of them going to New York, getting leave, going over to Kiel, etc., in the evening they had their show again, and this time Ken asked Hughes Hallett and Usher over to dinner. The show was better than it had ever been, and Ken enjoyed himself thoroughly. The Koningsberg was the light cruiser that Admiral Hipper's representative, to whom Beatty virtually dictated the conditions of the internment, which was a de facto surrender. Beatty had threatened to take the island of Heligoland if the Germans weren't ready to sail on the prescribed date of the 18th. The threat wasn't carried out, and Ken records the arrival of the High Seas Fleet off the Firth three days later. Thursday, November 21st. Unmoored at 2.45am and went out to escort the German fleet in. The whole of the Grand Fleet went out. We went to action stations at about 8.15 and sighted the Seidlitz at about 9.15. They were in this order. Seidlitz, Molke, Der Flinger, Hindenburg, Von der Tann, a simply hopeless ship, looks rather like an old cruiser. 
Friedrich de Gross, Kaiser, Kaiserin, König Albrecht, Prinz Regent Leopold, Bayern, Grosser Kufferts, Machgraf, and Kronprinz Wilhelm. Then came eight light cruisers, Frankfurt, Bremen, Emden, Köln, Brümer, Brems, Nürnberg, Pelau, and then fifty destroyers. Quite an interesting day on the whole. We escorted them in, and they anchored off Inchkeith. The list of the capital ships accords with other records, but there are problems with the names of the eight light cruisers. The official fleet plan displayed by the triumphant British on a widely circulated poster headed Der Tag lists only seven light cruisers, those Ken mentions together with Karlsruhe, but without either Pellau or Bremen. Ken's list is clearly deficient, both in number and in names. There was a light cruiser called Bremen, but it struck Russian mines and sank in 1915. There was also a passenger liner called Bremen, which repatriated some of the German crews after the ships were interned at Scarpa. Dan Vandervat lists the eight light cruisers which were eventually scuttled as Brems, Bruma, Dresden, Köln, Karlsruhe, Nuremberg, Emden and Frankfurt. However, according to Van der Vacht's book, the Dresden didn't sail with the main group, having been badly damaged in action. There are also records that the Dresden had been blown up and scuttled by her crew off the coast of Chile in 1915, so there is still some mystery there. As to the Karlsruhe, there is a report in Wikipedia that she blew up on passage to the West Indies in 1914. So either Ken simply got the wrong names, or the Germans renamed two other ships to replace earlier ones that had been lost. After this, Ken's diary rather peters out. Between the 24th and 26th of November, the German ships were escorted up to Scarpa. But the war spite seems not to have been part of the escort. The usual routine continued, with several trips ashore. Soon the Americans, the 6th Battle Squadron, were on their way home. Sunday, December the 1st. Didn't get much pay this month. At about 1100 hours we got under way and proceeded out of the harbour. As we passed the Yanks, of course, we cheered. We waited for the 6th BS outside and escorted them out to May Island. The Barham and Malaya on one side and Valiant and us on the other. Opposite May Island we turned 16 points, 90 degrees, and cheered each ship as it passed. New York, Texas, Nevada, Wyoming, Arkansas and Florida. We then went back. In the evening, at dinner time, we got a signal that our squadron and others were getting ten days' leave each watch from the 7th of December, and so we thought we should get the whole twenty days. A contrary rumour on the 2nd about their leave was corrected on the 3rd, and Ken's diary ends on the 4th of December, with cancelled instruction and a hockey match frustrated by lack of a ground. We presume Kenneth had his 20 days leave. He remained with Warspite for another 18 months. The captain, E.K. Loving, reporting on the 4th of May 1919 that midshipman Thomas K. W. Atkinson conducted himself very satisfactorily, an alert young officer who promises well. Kenneth's next appointment on the 20th of June 1920 was to HMS Versatile a 900-ton destroyer commissioned in February 1918 and not scrapped until 1947, having seen service through World War II. Six months later, he was appointed to the battlecruiser Repulse and in September 1921 was promoted to acting sub-lieutenant. In January 1922, he was posted to HMS Walrus, a 1,100-ton destroyer commissioned on March 1918 and scrapped in 1938 after having been wrecked by Philly Bay 
while under tow with a skeleton crew on her way to Chatham for conversion. Three months later, April 1922, he went to Pembroke College, Cambridge, for about two terms as one of the scholars, celebrated by Rudyard Kipling in his poem of that name. Young naval officers, who had been sent to sea during the war before their general education was complete, and who had missed out on much of the fun and relaxation of their teenage years. It was probably during this period that Kenneth developed his interest in and love of history, and also started his long, if intermittent, career as a representative of the Royal Navy at hockey. Two reports of Kenneth's early hockey career survive, though neither the dates nor the publications are recorded. The apparently earlier one relates to Sub-Lieutenant Atkinson having caught the eye of those critics who have some weight in council and know a good player when they see one, and refers to his fine dash, speed, stickwork, centering and general control of the ball when doing the wing sprint for the Royal Navy against Cambridge University at Beckenham recently. The latter report, under the heading Weekly Reflections, covers two international trial matches, in one of which Kenneth played for the combined services against the north of England at Sheffield, a game fraught with considerable interest, as it is no secret that Sub-Lieutenant Atkinson has suddenly become a much-talked-of young player for future internationals. In the same article, Kenneth's name is included among three others as probably finding places in a strong rest of England side in the final trials be played at Beckenham on the 3rd of March that year in 1922. Family hearsay has it that he was in fact picked for that final trial, but had to withdraw because of an injury collected playing football for his ship the day before the trial. The academic interlude, including no doubt more ragging, as he once related, finished with appointment to HMS Dido, January 1923, for three months, for torpedo boat destroyer training. In March 1923, he was awarded the Beaufort and Wharton testimonials for the year 1922, based on the results of his sub lieutenant's exams, which probably marked the beginning of his professional career as a navigating officer. This prize commemorated the work of two hydrographers of the Navy, Rear Admirals Sir Francis Beaufort and Sir William Wharton, and was bestowed annually on the midshipmen who passed the best examination in navigation and pilotage for the rank of lieutenant in the Navy. The Beaufort in question was the officer who devised the wind speed scale that is still in use, and Wharton was the hydrographer of the Navy from 1884 to 1904, as engraved on the gold medal, which came with the testimonial. <laughs>